Hi everyone, I'm Kadambri Sahu. I'm the head of design at Valulad. Design Inspire is a web series of passionate, innovative and young inspiring designers. The web series dive into their passion, inspiration and what makes them go. It's an effort to understand how they are navigating their career path and how they are investing their creative energies. We believe hearing their bold moves and inspiring stories will ignite interest and inspire the next generation of budding designers across the globe. So let's go forward. Hello everyone, welcome to Design Inspire. Our today's guest is Vejanti. Vejanti is an ethnographer and consultant under her brand Rasa in New York City. Most recently, she is applying her ethnography skills at the lab at Capital One using customer experiences as fodder for product innovation in banking and credit card space. She is also an adjunct professor of applied anthropology at the City University of New York. She has been a dancer for 25 plus years trained in different Indian classical dance such as Bharatanatyam, Odissi, and Kathak. She has been building on the art of expression, Abhinay, and the art of studying what it means to be human anthropology, to explore fiction writing and performance, particularly in the observational comedy space. Hello and welcome, Vejanti. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the format of this show, Vejanti. So what we're going to do is the first part, the 20 minutes would be anything that you're you know, passionate about, any presentation, any stories that you want to share with us. The later part uh, would be me and you conversing on topic of, you know, the life of a designer, uh, in your case, a researcher, and anthropologist, and, you know, how things uh, are in terms of like, how do you inspire and motivate yourself? So that will be more on the life um, of a designer or a creative person. Um, so let's go forward. We're very excited uh, to hear uh, stories from you. Over to you, Vijanti. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to start with a story about my, my first teaching experience, teaching applied anthropology. The first day of class, I asked students, um, why are you studying anthropology? A few students raised their hand and said, because I majored in it. A few students um, left the class, dropped the class that day. <laughs> and then one student in particular said very confidently, I have no idea what anthropology is. I'm just here because it sounded cool. So that student um, became, well, they're, they're all my favorites, but became one of my uh, prize students because um, the student went from not really understanding what anthropology was. And the simplest way I'd like to explain it is anthropology is a study of what it means to be human. There's many branches. Um, I'm going to focus on the cultural anthropology aspect of this. So I'm teaching this class, how do you apply anthropology in the real world? And uh, the student definitely kept me on my toes, a lot of sarcastic comments. Uh, it was amazing. Definitely wanted to establish themselves as the comedian of the class. And uh, it wasn't until COVID hit in New York City and, the pen and we became the epicenter of the pandemic that the student really realized the value and how widespread the practice application and even philosophy of anthropology could be applied. So I asked them, you know, I, I said, let's take a breather. You know, this is not about class anymore, <clears throat> but use what you've learned in class so far and talk to me about how this pandemic, how um, the environment of COVID has affected you personally. And this student went and um, thought about it for a little while and in their paper wrote about how their family in spite of having some cases in their family, insisted on going to church. And the student so far had never realized how religious their family was, nor how deeply ingrained their norms and beliefs were until this incident. Um, the student was very upset. The student said, I, I respect my religion, I respect my spirituality, but I didn't realize that the culture of uh, my religion could override the, the, the value of health itself. So that was one very pivotal moment in this student's life um, and perspective. And then since then, the student said, well, I don't want to be an anthropologist, but I do want to apply anthropology to the world of finance. So when we're doing due diligence on investments, I can use, um, I could go beyond the quantitative and use qualitative uh, observational methods to help my team to help us 
find the most uh, lucrative investments, to find the most intelligent investments, and I will also have an edge over others. So this was um, this was my experience in in teaching anthropology, and it was it was really great because I I feel that there's there's really no um, corner that anthropology can't touch, you know. So this is this is why um, it renewed a sense of why I fell in love with this subject, why I continue to practice it. But I've definitely gone through ebbs and flows myself of um, this field. I, I always loved it, but what happened to the application of it? Um, in uh, we were talking earlier about in corporate settings, um, in any workplace settings, there's there's a lot of pressure on timelines, and you continue to get squeezed and you get squeezed. And the very nature of anthropology is immerse yourself in the cultures. Um, take time to observe people in different states. Every day won't look the same. If you sit them down for a three hour interview one day and then you do the same interview one week later, they might be saying completely different things. How do you bridge the gap? And the gap is only bridged truly by observing what they do in their natural setting instead of asking them what they say. So we want to, we want to kind of bridge that do and say gap. So um, so I, I, I realized that going through this ebb and flow, what I had not done until very recently was an autoethnography. And I, I really advocate for this, this method. And I feel that all researchers, really all people should <laughs> kind of do an autoethnography to understand why you're doing what you're doing, to understand essentially what forces have have been combined to make make you who you are and um, show you what you believe in. So a lot of times um, we've, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but there have been critiques of autoethnography saying it's very self-absorbed, maybe even narcissistic. There's some people that are like, this is not academic, this is not rigorous, you know, um, what, what, what's going on here? But I feel that if you, if you understand your layers, if you understand what you remember, if you understand what you connect to, then you can kind of understand your biases when you're doing research and not only doing the research as in conducting, sitting, observing, but also synthesizing. And in synthesizing, with the knowledge of what what your beliefs are, what your values are, you can learn to edit um, according to your biases, against your biases, and kind of level set and calibrate. So, um, so for example, you know, I I will use my own identity. Um, pretty obvious, female of Indian origin, grew up in the United States. So, so I realized that. Um, I was always over indexing on minorities and I still continue to do that. I was always over indexing on remembering the stories of uh, people of global majority, people of color over the, the majority Caucasian populations. And I had to recalibrate that in some of my research because yes, I would take copious notes. Yes, I would um, note down everything everyone said. But then when it came to synthesis and kind of putting together things both from your notes, but also from your memory, also from the epiphanies that struck, you have to understand that all of those come from uh, inherent bias. We, we can't remove bias, but we can kind of adjust for it and we can be very systematic of um, shaping it, shaping it to, um, to be more meaningful, both for the client and for yourself. So, uh, so in that way, I think um, I think we uh, hold on one second. In that way, I think um, autoethnography is a course that I wanted to teach. So I'm going to start teaching that course in January. And what we're going to do is use autoethnography to explore. Um, students' current sentiments around the Black Lives Matter movement, around the pandemic, and other global phenomena that's happening right now. So I, I do um, have to give credit to Ruth Behar, who has been, she wrote a lot of amazing books. One of my favorite is The Vulnerable Observer. And she talks about incorporating yourself, your emotions, and your background in your research. 
So uh, I, I mention all of this because we often talk about research being learning about uh, being in the shoes of the other and research being about understanding other people's lives. And I think that is completely the aim of research, but you can't understand what is other if you don't understand what is yourself. And you don't, and if you don't understand the separation of when your self is kind of um, bleeding into the interpretation of the other. And then in classical anthropology, I mean, there was, it started from kind of this Western gaze of the exotic other of the exotic Eastern cultures, you know, so it's definitely evolved from there and it's definitely evolved from the, the kind of Western superiority that it used to hold. Um, but we still have a ways to go and, and we don't want to have that kind of power dynamic of like, well, this is where we stand and we're right, you know, nor should it be, you know, what it's becoming now where the customer is always right, or the client is always right, or that three in, three hour interview is also um, the gospel, you know, because we we have to we have to kind of use our own uh, faculties and our own backgrounds to interpret some of these uh, some of these situations. Um, so I wanted to talk more about like how I got into this, how I got into this space. And um, we met because I gave a talk on how my background in Indian classical dance led me to anthropology. But then on upon further introspection, upon further autoethnography, I realized that wasn't the central why of why I got into this. Um, so I'm going to turn it to you, Kadambari, and ask you what you think of this image, this artifact that I'm going to show you from my life. Um, and this, to me, explains a lot about uh, why I got into anthropology. Okay, I can see you there. And I can see like a lot of people with different uh, cultural backgrounds or, you know, uh, different cultures. And with the image that I can see, like, you know, you're standing in between and there's also this thing of a you know, girl just looking at the different uh, people there who are your friends maybe, or, you know, people you are with them right now. Um, but what I see is not like same sort of people there. There's a lot of major, like, you know, different sort of uh, people who are there, different cultures. Maybe you wanted to understand them better. Um, and from this picture, if I have to infer, like take a long leap, I, I would say that you want you were interested in um, your friends there and wanted to understand them better. So that was the starting point for you to start on anthropology. Awesome. Yes, um, that that was definitely a huge part of it, wanting to understand them more. But I think even more than that, this was this was home to me. Home was multicultural. Home was multilingual. Home was. Uh, every other friend I had was a child of immigrants. So I was always clamoring to get back to that sense of home. And, and to me, I think always, this is what home will look like. And it is also um, important to note that this was some kind of, you know, wear your cultural dress <laughs> performance or program that they put on for us when we were, I don't know, like, I guess looks like four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And that's also a part of it, you know, hold on to where you came from, hold on to your stories as you kind of hold hands with everyone else, you know, join forces. So it's kind of, it's a very like utopian, you know, we're, we're all a happy family, but I, I really did grow up in that. I mean, you, you learned little bits and pieces of other people's language and it was it was cool it wasn't like strange it was awesome that you could you know i i think i knew a little bit of korean and greek growing up and definitely spanish um and i speak the only thing i retain now is spanish i don't know any of those other languages but i mean it's it's awesome to grow up in this uh, kind of environment where you know, there isn't one majority, there isn't one minority, it's kind of, it's kind of peppered throughout. So I realized that, I mean, this is why I study anthropology, because I'm always trying to bridge these differences and say, you know, we could be different, but we can still understand each other. Um, we can still coexist. And it, it really does follow a lineage of anthropologists who've been activists. They've been 
um, promoters of equality and justice. I mean, the father of American anthropology, Frank Boas, is the one that kind of spread the um, the cultural relativism concept of like, you know, in within our cultural context, we we learn certain things, we have certain values. None is better than the other. It's all relative, and it's all you know it's it's different but equal kind of a sort of you know that's not that's not the best way to phrase it but um yeah so so this is essentially why i continue to dive into anthropology because you know you you get to a point where differences become similarities and similarities become differences and it keeps weaving in and out of um these these kind of norms and and abnormal but what you call abnormal, what you call normal is is always changing from this. So, so um, yeah, so I I say that uh, you can you can get really entrenched in learning about other people by learning about your story. Another thing I would say is um, in in my experience of how you tell these stories, and, and some of that, uh, we talked about some of those timelines being condensed and some of the stories of longitudinal study of deep immersion and ethnography are either you can't, you don't have time to actually explore them or you don't have time to tell them. I realized for, for me personally, writing those stories out, um, maybe even taking inspiration from those stories and writing fictional stories has been a great outlet. So I would say researchers, if you feel like I did all this work, I collected all these great stories, you know, you can, this is this is how how writers and filmmakers work. They they take from real life. So it is, you know, it is art imitating life. And you've seen all these life experiences. And if you need, if you need an outlet, I would say um, definitely go into some of these performing art spaces and some of these creative spaces to to really let that story breathe. So um, I think I, I think I'll end there. I mean, I have a few other things, but I think that's where I'll wrap up because I want to hear from you now. <laughs> sure. Uh, it was amazing to hear uh, you know thoughts how you got into ethnography and uh, uh, anthropology. Sorry, not ethnography, um, and you know how you continued. So you did talk about that. Uh, you know. Uh, understanding your friends was the starting point maybe or what is that was my at least leap uh, of like you know how did that get interest but I want to understand like at what time uh, what time in your like you know growing up you understood that you want to be an uh, anthropologist and uh, how did you go about becoming one mm -hmm. I think there's a few seeds that were planted and or, or a few breadcrumbs that were leading me to to practicing anthropology um, I think the first was uh, we had an exercise when we were in sixth grade where each each group of students had a different classic culture like Egyptian and Greek and then we painted pots according to the art and life of uh, those cultures broke the pots buried them in sand and then a different group so let's say I was in the group Egypt I would go to the to some other group they wouldn't tell us which one uncover you know the pieces of the broken pot and put it together and that's where I first learned about archaeology it's not to say this that our social studies were centering around um, anthropological fields but um, that one or two weeks or maybe it was even a few days I can't remember right now uh, left a big impact on me. Next was, um, I believe there was another social studies class around 13 or 14. And um, I, I don't quite remember what the class was, but I do remember them saying there are people who major in anthropology and that that planted the seed for, oh, I could actually study this. And then <clears throat> after, um, not quite after graduating, during you know the last years of university, one of my friends mentioned an article on corporate anthropology mm -hmm. because I, I felt um, my, my professor, my advisor gave me an assignment that would have been the precursor to a PhD in film and anthropology. And mm -hmm. I realized I didn't have the patience for it. And I think he kind of wanted to, he's like, he's like, it's yours if you want it, you can do the PhD. But at that, at that time, at that age, for whatever reason, I just, I, I was like, 
this one paper was enough. <laughs> and I don't think I have the stamina, the endurance, uh, God bless everyone who, who does, but I was like, I can't, I can't do this right now. So, um, you know, this, like his exercise combined with this friend showing me the article on corporate anthropology, which was a big light bulb moment. I didn't know this existed. Uh, definitely didn't hear about it in, in our school. I had heard about applied anthropology, but it was mostly applied to, um, social causes and uh for example that same advisor he applied his knowledge of drugs and culture to rehabilitation centers for addicts you know so so that's kind of like i saw it in very limited lenses and that corporate anthropology opened up wider doors i did start out doing uh work in nonprofits and and loosely applying my anthropology background but it was largely administrative <clears throat> So, so then that whole corporate anthropology came kind of screaming back like three or four years after my, my dabbling in the nonprofit world. And mm -hmm. I said, why, why not go into for profit? I shouldn't, I shouldn't be so black and white, you know, let's try both, both sides. And, um, and I actually was in sales and marketing before I said, let me create my own position as a, uh, it was a tech company a cloud computing company. So I said, if you want to sell cloud computing uh, products, and if you want to design them in a way that makes sense, you really need to study these highly skeptical, highly intelligent developers up close and see what's working for them, see what's already being used and and not build something equal or, or uh, let alone subpar, you know, mm -hmm. you have to build something that's much better and you have to talk about it in a way that doesn't raise suspicion. So um, I created this developer anthropologist role and I was in Silicon Valley like every week. <laughs> I basically <laughs> lived there and um, went to conferences. So so that's kind of how it's how it started. OK, um, you talk about applying anthropology to design, right? Like uh, so how has that journey been? And uh, can you elaborate like uh, how it can be used actually in the corporate settings? Uh, so th there's there's lots of different ways, but basically, I mean, when when I work with designers, they're they're trying to solve problems elegantly, beautifully, uh, intelligently, and kind of seamlessly, you know. So there's this, um, I believe it's a Parsi phrase: "Be like sugar and milk." Mm -hmm. So I feel like the sugar is um, that user research. And then, you know, when you're sugar and milk, you don't see the sweetness, you don't see the research, you don't see the intelligence behind, but it, it tastes and feels better. So I feel that our research has to be, um, I mean, it's the designer's part to, to kind of weave it in seamlessly, but as a researcher that hopefully brings the designer along the ethnographic journey, uh, it, it truly is that, like immersing yourself, um, collecting these stories, making sure uh, the, the depth of and nuance of the human experience is always present in every part of the decision-making process. It's, it's kind of astonishing how quickly that uh, mindset can drop if mm -hmm. you or somebody in the room is not advocating for the customer mm -hmm. because very easily it could become, well, it's just too difficult to build that. It's just too, uh, Ah, do we really need to worry about that, you know, level of comfort or do we really need to worry? You, it's, it's just incredible how quickly that perspective can drop because of a, 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 you know, very understandable practical business need or it's just too difficult on the engineering side, um, but not impossible, you know, so, so we really have to be uh, remembering and retelling these stories that we found out in the field to keep everyone in that like, kind of like present with the customer because the customer is not in the room. They don't get to be in the room. So you have to keep kind of invoking them in, in, and their, their stories and their spirit in, into the design process. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the methods that you applied? Like you did talk about, you know, some of the things like immersing uh, and longitudinal, uh, you know, um, FTUX and things like that. Do you want to elaborate on that uh, for people, like what it means and what it is? Yeah, uh, sure. So there's on on the observation side, there's covert observation and participant observation. So covert is essentially spying, you know. So I'll I'll bring in one of my favorite 
projects I got to work on, which was my my first project when I became in, when I went independent, was a design group in Denmark mm -hmm. wanted to build. They wanted to revolutionize products for the visually impaired. They're like, why are we still using the stick, the cane? Um, we need to we need to blow this out of the water. We can Im incorporate motion sensing. So. Uh, and we want to launch in New York City, which is a very different place from Copenhagen. It's like we we know like everything is different, you know. So how do we how do we go about doing this for that context? Mm -hmm. And what I had done was, first of all, learned a lot of valuable lessons in gatekeepers because there was a lot of folks when I called and said, "I'm a researcher," and I should have known this, but I, you know, you you learn lessons many times. I should have known that you can't just go in and say, "I'm a researcher. I want to stare at your community and take notes and be weird." You know, they're like, "We're not guinea pigs. We get about ten calls like this every day. Um, we are not interested." And I realized, you know, you have to. There is an exchange that we always talk about in. Uh, traditional anthropology, like you, you do have to give back to the society that's giving so much knowledge to you. So I became a volunteer at one of the shelters. And in that way, I was able to, um, and, and then of course, I kept all the names anonymous, but I was able to respectfully be there, but still be a fly on the wall, listen, and both engage, but also be kind of covert in, in like the conversations I listened to. And there's so much value in that, especially a group that is completely different from your own. <clears throat> I, I didn't realize, for example, that the actual material of uh, the the stick, the, the cane, mattered. So there's plastic, there's rubber. Um, plastic allows people to tap and it kind of creates like an echo. So people, the you're kind of warned or, or even they can see, oh, it's this material or that material based on the echo. The rubber is less slippery but it kind of mutes out the sound, especially when it's snowing. And so there's all these things that I was like, I listened to a conversation. All of this was from me just sitting there like, mm -hmm, like listening to a conversation between two of the members of the community. And I would have never gotten this information. I wouldn't have known to ask this information um, yeah. in a million years, you know? And I, I did listen to podcasts. I did try to do my uh, secondary research up front, So I came and informed, but in no way was I, was I, that well informed that I got these kinds of intimate conversations about materials, about the, the really day-to-day -day, um, difficulties and nuances of navigating the city as a visually impaired person. So I, I always advocate for starting with a combination of secondary research, pot, and, and that includes podcasts, that includes um, academic articles, even, you know, not, not even academic articles, but just find all kinds of resources, stories, uh, from the group that you are intending to study, um, but also do some of the covert observation. And then the participant observation was, like I said, I was a volunteer, so I would engage with them, I would talk to them, but I was essentially part of the community. It's not always possible, I, I understand that, but if there is a seamless, respectful, ethical way to do that, always start with that, because I, I cite that one example of the material, because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what questions to ask and that will give you the most intelligent kind of briefing to then create your um, interview questions. The interview should be like the second part of the, the, the whole research journey. Yeah, yeah that, that's really awesome to hear like, you know, how you went about it. Uh, I want to focus on one of the things that you talked about that was ethics and it's it's really important you know being that you know we're taking so much from uh, the people understanding them so what do you think are good practices for a researcher who's you know like a new budding design like you know, let's say researcher who's coming into the field knows like you know how to conduct the research but what the part of ethics uh, what do you think that should be uh, you know taken care of when you're doing um, interviews or any of those uh, things mm -hmm. There's, um, you know, there's like kind of the, the standard legal side of ethics, there is the cultural sensitivity side of ethics, and, and there's probably so many others that I'm, I'm not going to cover. So do, by no means is this exhaustive, but let's start with the cultural sensitivity. That's where doing your homework, being prepared uh, to, to seek out participants, seek out your those that will help you in your research in a respectful way, in a non-offensive way, kind of list out cultural norms. 
and you know for example even like home interviews people too some people still don't know uh, like you have to take off your shoes in many people's homes and they just come barging in with their cameras and their shoes and it's just it's like like you know 101 kind of thing you know um so there's yeah, that's a very small example but there's also things you say i came in calling around saying hey can i just sit there observe you know you're visually impaired not realizing how uh, how um greedy that was in a way how uh disrespectful it was this is where people come to feel safe to feel um cared for to to really let loose and hang out with people that are like them and and you don't want i mean if you go into like any kind of safe space what, how would you feel if someone's staring so i should have you know this was early on but i should have known that so kind of these um cultural sensitivity and, and even just on a human level code of ethics and then on the legal side you know i will not present your name i will not present your whatever um the, the participant is comfortable with you have to honor that so you'll have consent forms if um, you know we've run into this a few times where people are like, I, I didn't realize you were going to videotape us, even if it was cleared. You know these things happen, even if it was cleared by whatever recruiting company, or even if we spoke directly to them, they just changed their mind. You know, and you have to honor that. And if they don't want to sign that consent form, maybe have another one ready. Say, can we record audio at least, and and not use your name. And you know, so so keep adjusting those things, but make sure everything is clear to the participant and not only clear but obviously comfortable to them in that moment um and then uh obviously on your side have everything ready to to be signed to be verified so i'm gonna ask you another question which is like uh, we generally do in design well we're you know constructing a persona and i want to construct a person of a person who's a researcher so i want to understand mm -hmm. the day in the life of a researcher so how it is how it is yours like if you are a researcher who's doing on a on a project how does your day in life looks like uh, a day in the life i think the if you're going to talk about personas which you know kind of put you into this like static state which is you know a, a little unfair for any kind of person i i would say the biggest commonality is you have to be a good improviser okay. i would i would stand by that to for anybody you know you're you're an improviser you may have to have a poker face <laughs> because you don't know um it's it's an awkward thing to say your improv a, improvisation implies like great performance but your performance is being you know very okay you know like oh you just you just screamed at me okay okay you know like, like you know there's there's that um i believe there's a sense of listening i mean you know heard this a lot but the best researchers kind of put themselves, at least in some of these interviews, kind of put themselves and their personality as secondary or backgrounded to what's going on in front of them. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, a little bit like, um, and it's not to say that's who they are all the time, but in these research settings. And then you ask for specifically a day in the life. I mean, let's talk about a day in the life uh, in in the field. I think it's, it's, um, coming up with and let's say truly in the field you don't have a camera you just have a notebook and let's say it's something like with the visually impaired i couldn't go in with a camera uh, you you have to set out with what are some questions you have to answer from the previous day or your previous research have those questions in the background but always be listening for something unexpected always be fresh eyes always be um kind of arguing with your assumptions and your biases and uh be kind of, uh, is opportunistic the right way? you know like like be ready to jump at an opportunity to speak with somebody or to be involved in an activity or um to kind of go with the flow of what this natural setting is presenting to you because you you never know if uh that might be a hidden gem that might be the one thing that unexpectedly led to the product innovation to the beautiful design you know you never know so undercurrent is game of improv um yes yeah, start out with some objectives start out with like a loose structure but always leave room for surprises okay uh, you also draw a lot of parallels between uh, you know the performance art uh, and you know you've also talked about like how it can be a good outlet uh, for researchers to you know uh, you know 
publish those stories or you know create something uh, from that sort and you are also also a performance artist so how do you see these two things coming together for you uh for me i i got into writing scripts just like putting together these stories and these characters that i've that have been floating around in my head very recently it mm -hmm. was never really on my radar so um so it was just a it was just very surprising that this came to be so uh i believe that if you in fiction in fictionalized versions of these ethnographic experiences you can have some license for interpretation which is not like well where did you get that from where's the proof where's the proof you're like no i just i can just infer it i can just feel it you know you can give yourself permission to do that because yes we again we are people and if you are talking to someone and you're reading between the lines and you're kind of like your colleague is reading between the lines but the executive is like well they didn't say it word for word they didn't say i like the color green and i like uh, buttons that are round versus <laughs> square I don't, you did not prove this to me i don't see the evidence you need to back it up um you're, you're kind of like oh my gosh you know so so it's a it's a chance to um you know fill in those those in between the lines kind of stories and I, I gave like a very mundane example, but there's all kinds of other things. Well, you don't like round buttons because you're very <laughs> this and this and this, you know, so you can just go with your imagination. You can go with um, the little, the little like peaks that people give, the little glimpses people give into their lives. And you could keep expanding on that because inevitably it'll be percolate, percolating in your head of like, who are they? You know, I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper. Well, in your imagination, in your stories, you can go deeper. So I find that for me personally, that was an unexpected uh, gift to kind of let out some of these things, these characters that have been like, I didn't even know, under, know were running around in my head. <laughs> so, um it's it's like you know these uh, fields that we are in are much driven by passion than anything else right uh, i want to understand what keeps you moving like you know uh, in the direction what made you feel and what is the rewarding experience for you being in anthropology and research yeah i think what's keeping me moving these days more than anything is the the newfound teaching mm -hmm. um personally because uh i get to experience um and I, I, when I teach, I, it's a very much like self-designed kind of um, approach to it. So I get to see anthropology applied to areas that I didn't even think to apply it to, or maybe I thought about it, but I didn't realize how exciting it could be for somebody. So I think that that keeps it fresh for me. I think um, outside of that, yes, the performance aspect is uh, something that really helps. I mean, you know, did I, did I observe this, am I representing this person of this cultural group very accurately? Uh, will will some anthropologist colleague come after me and be like, what a caricature you built? What are you doing? You know, like, so I think some of this is like, uh, you know, we speak of ethics and if you're doing comedy, you're kind of like ethical comedy. Like, I, I don't know, like ethical representation of this person from this subgroup, um, but still make it funny, you know, like it's, I think that's giving me new life and new challenge mm -hmm. um, in and and also allowing me to go a little bit deeper into listening and researching in a way that for uh, consumer design or B2B design, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd gone to a certain level, but I couldn't go further into that story, whereas this um, medium of performance art demands you to go really far into that story. Because the, the reason is like in in business settings, they're like, okay, we don't need any more, you know? So you almost, you're like, oh, I, if you don't need more, I'm not gonna invest more time. Sometimes you get to that point where you're like, all right, we got enough. But it's in the end to learn about a person's life, you can never have enough data and stories, right? So. Now talking about business, I want to understand like, you know, it's, it's very tough uh, to talk about research and, you know, in the corporate setting and, you know, to breathe and give that amount of time. So how do you emphasize the value of research to your business stakeholders? Yeah, um, I feel like there's there's been uh, an interesting shift for for me and, and perhaps I've learned from some others where previously it would be like, 
let's advocate for it. Let's push, let's push, let's push. And now it's been a little bit of a, let them do the research, let them not only sit in on an interview, but, you know, ask some of the questions up front, some of kind of the rapport building questions. And um, even more important than that, I believe is having non-researchers collaborate in the synthesis mm -hmm. because I feel like, um, and, and some institutions, organizations already do this, of course, but I feel like that's when people I've seen shift from skeptical of research, why does this take so much time to like, oh my gosh, had we not had this much time to synthesize mm -hmm. the information, we wouldn't have gotten this um, you, we wouldn't have connected the dots between these these two behaviors and understood that it was a negotiation of finances and priorities, for example. You know, so there's there's um, something to sitting back and allowing people to essentially immerse themselves in a research world. So you're kind of it's kind of like eating our own dog food. You're like, hey, let's let the non-researcher. Uh, do participant observation, do an ethnography, be an ethnographer in a researcher's world. And only then, I believe, will they truly buy into all of this. It's not always possible. I, I know with uh, stakeholders, but if you get, you know, bit by bit, if you get more and more people to immerse themselves in the world of research, I think the work will be done for you. You don't have to push. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask you another tough question in, in that regard. So there's always like there's never uh, nobody is going to tell us that, you know, that this this is, is the you know endless time you have to, you know, continue your project and things like that. Most of the time it's like very, you know, uh, uh, put into a very tight de deadline and very short uh, sort of, you know, workshops and things are conducted uh, to create, uh, you know, maybe research or design uh, for that matter. So how do you negotiate with uh, such things or uh, or do you negotiate or how do you think that, you know, people should find, what are your suggestions maybe? Mm -hmm. I think um, it's always important to negotiate, never back down from that, but, but also know when, um, when, when you're, when you're spending more time negotiating than researching, if, if, if you know what I mean, like if it's holding up the process or if it's taking away, uh, you know, other things you could be doing. So, so first of all, balance that out and, and what you're negotiating for. Because if you start thinking creatively about repurposing research, and, I, and it doesn't work in every circumstance, but there are situations where there's been some foundational research done about, you know, for example, how, how uh, folks in a certain area think about their personal finances and the fears and myths that they have. So if you've kind of taken a good um, deep longitudinal approach to that world, maybe you can use some of that research to uh, supplement the, the kind of drain of time that you have on this current project. So, so yes, look, it's, 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 I'm saying contradictory things, but you have to look at this project with fresh eyes and say, what does this project need? But, oh, hey, the people and the sentiments and some of the cultural aspects are the same as this other project. Or, you know, there's there's all these fantastic anthropologists and other academics that have done years and lifetime of work on some of these areas. Please, you know, build from them, borrow from them, use, use some of this research um, to do, uh, to kind of, you know, up like, to start out a little bit on a higher plane with your own research. So I think, um, you know, while you negotiate and that's that's like a hard battle to win, you can find other ways to deepen your research and and um, kind of make up for lost time or make up for time that's been cut from you. All right. Uh, now I'm going to ask you some of the things that keeps inspiring you. I, I'm, I understand, like you know, in current times and pandemic, there's a lot of things happening. But uh, you did uh, talk about you know what keeps you motivated. But what are in general, like even before pandemic and even now, what are things in life that inspires you? Hmm. Things in life that inspire me. Well, it's become a lot more grounded. Like that answer would have been very different pre-pandemic. I would have been like, it's the parties. No, just kidding. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I feel like I've come to a point where um, living in, in 
these quiet times it's it's a very you know kind of cliche answer but like family and cooking food and my dog and you know these these kinds of things inspire me and um I in nature I mean I've you know like what what can you do you don't you don't want to gather with too many people but you still want to be out so to say and I feel like being in nature you you learn a lot um or you don't learn a lot and it's fine it's fine to not keep grinding and learning and producing and processing all the time some rest is is needed uh but but pre-pandemic times i i joked and said parties but i i think i i went i was lucky enough to gather with so many cool people like that i met you at yeah. the ixca conference i would um make it a ritual to go to this margaret mead film festival it was an ethnographic film festival in new york and um and then and then film festivals themselves there's a lot of south asian film festivals that have started budding up in in the us even and meeting the people behind the films the storytellers the they are in in their own way ethnographers you know they're putting uh, a studied life on camera so uh these people these um gatherings were and and probably still will inspire me once uh, once we resume yeah. Uh, what are the some recommendations that you will give for young uh, researchers and designers? Um, I would say, I would say read some of the classic anthropologists' works. So Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, and then more recently Ruth Behar. I talked about her book *Vulnerable Observer*, and kind of find find even if you're not professing to be an anthropologist, I think you could find a lot of inspiration from how they took anthropology, made it their own, but then also gave uh, a lot of respect to the culture, cultural groups they were studying. And um, so that's, you know, that's going deep into your practice. I think it's equally important to get out of your practice. So do something completely different, shake up your mind. I, I talked a lot about how, um, research is a game of improv and I would say take improv classes <laughs> I would highly recommend that because it's just fun I think any industry I mean just you have to get out of your head it is scary but so is uh, you show up to a client's house they're not expecting you your camera's not working um, they hate you <laughs> whatever it is you know you have to be ready for the, some of these challenges and still make the most of it and still see the benefit in, in it. Just like an improv, anything that's given to you, you have to make a scene out of it. Uh, so I think take improv classes. I obviously am biased, but any kind of artistic outlet, you know, have that, have that just for the sake of having it, whatever it might be, crocheting, painting, dancing, um, you know. So I, I, I think these, these are some things I could offer. And in general, like people who are getting into design or any sort of career, what sort of thing they should look out for? Or some of your suggestions in terms of, you know, going on to a career which is more creative or, uh, you know, research related and things like that. What, were, what would be your advice to them? So um, I would say uh, for folks getting into a career, I, in the beginning, I talked uh, maybe a little too much about autoethnography, but it's only because I think it's more important than ever. Or maybe it's always been incredibly important to know why you're getting into something and keep keep revisiting that why. Keep reexamining why um, why you're doing what you're doing, why you're studying what you're studying, why you're advocating for certain approaches, and a lot of times we see even in these supposed creative fields this kind of like there's mother duck and then baby duck is going to follow and make sure you know there's there's some imprinting of like i idolize this designer i idolize this anthropologist and you know that's wonderful they probably deserve a, a lot of that but also make sure you know beyond idolizing this person beyond idolizing this career path um truly for yourself authentically why you're doing uh, and, and embarking on this path well that was a great uh, you know uh, advice piece of advice to be authentic and to look uh, into yourself right before idolizing others yeah uh, that was great uh, 
I would now want to thank you uh, for you know coming and sharing your thoughts with us today, and uh, for the great work that you're doing and you know inspiring so many people. Uh, we we want to just uh, confer upon you a small love uh, and uh, you know a token of appreciation from our side, and I'll just share that with you. So we just want to share uh, <laughs> with you uh, that you, today you are our inspiring young designer, uh, Vajanti. Thanks for coming and sharing your thoughts uh, with us. Uh, we really loved, uh, you know, listening to your stories um, on being authentic and, you know, how it, how it means to be anthropologist and researcher and how you do you apply that. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Thank you. Thank you. This was such, a, such an honor and um, I love the series you're putting together. I admire the work you're doing and, and thank you so much for having me.